Hi. When working low-level software such as graphics drivers, writing the code is only part of the job. The other part comes in once you ship to production and the bug reports start flooding in. So at that point, as a developer, you have to sit down and figure out why are games crashing all of a sudden? Why is there a rendering glitch in my game? And why is there a performance regression all of a sudden? Figuring out the source of these problems can be quite non-trivial sometimes, because what you're looking at is not the graphics driver in isolation, but instead the application running on top of your actual project. So sometimes you sit down for a day or two and you find a problem immediately, and other times you just stare at the screen for weeks after weeks, not understanding what's even going on, until that one day you finally find the problem. It's a one-line fix, just swapping one magical constant for another, and the problem is magically gone. Whenever something like that happens to me, I do celebrate my victory eventually for a bit, but then I sit down and ask myself, what could I have done differently to make this more painful? In particular, what kind of debugging tools would I have liked to have at my disposal to make my job easier here, so I can waste less time debugging this? Today we'll take a look at one tool I wrote to make understanding the structure of shaders used by retail games more quickly. Um, so naturally we see a lot of shader code, we see some fancy graphs, and also we might see the first Vulkan driver running in the browser. My name is Tony Vaserka. I work as a contractor with Valve on improving the state of Linux graphics, and welcome to my talk. Now what do I mean with debugging tools though? On the CPU side, there are actually a couple of categories I'd like to distinguish here. The first one begins when you actually compile your program already. It's the compiler itself. The compiler tells you about missing return values and functions, about unused variables, about potential uh, potential integer overflows and something like that. And it's a very, really, really valuable resource for finding bugs early. And there's tools such as ClunkTidy that perform even more advanced static analysis in your program. The more traditional category is, of course, GDB itself, but also tools such as Perf and S-Trace. And there's tools that allow you to inspect the low-level view of your program, such as Ob Object Dump and the reverse engineering tools IDA and Gitra. There is dynamic, dynamic instrumentation, such as Valgrand and ASAN, which allow you to detect bugs in your program at runtime, such as integer overflows. And then there is um, standard interfaces, such as uh, slash proc and dbuzz, that allow you to extend your own programs with interfaces that help people or external applications access information specific to your application. Now, when looking at this list, I was asking myself, okay, this all works on the CPU side. But what if I'm working on a GPU program? What if I'm working on a game? What if I'm working on my graphics driver? We don't really have any good tools to inspect things that happen on the GPU. One example. I've written a very simple um, application that just renders a triangle using a simple fragment shader. The fragment shader colors everything below a certain line uh, in a grayish tone, that's this 0.4 branch, and everything above the line in a whitish tone. And to do so, it just compares the fragment coordinate in the program against the hard-coded constant. If you run this program using RADV debug shaders, then the graphics driver RADV will output um, its intermediate representation for the AQIR uh, for the shader to standard output. And if you're anything like me and you have never seen this before, you will stare at this and be completely lost probably. The first time I looked at this, I was just completely overwhelmed. So the first thing I did was to bring a little bit of structure into this and reorder the blocks in a graphical representation, something like this. And I think that already helps a lot because you can quite easily see the binary structure, although the edge connectivity between the blocks is somewhat misleading, perhaps. We see why that is in a bit. Now, I don't really have time for every single shader to get my pen and pencil 
a pen and paper and write such a graphic each time. So I was asking myself, is there a way to automate this process? And well, I wouldn't be giving this talk if the answer were no. So yes, indeed there is. I've written such a tool, I call it Shader DNA, and this is what it looks like. So in the beginning, there is a blank canvas. And what you can do is there is a text field on the left where you can um, just enter any kind of acro IR. Um, there are other ways of input, but we'll get to that in a moment. But once you input the shader like that, the tool will automatically create a graphical representation of the control flow graph of this program. And that is super useful, isn't it? Because now, just by looking at this graphic and without understanding the details of the AQIR, you can immediately see, OK, there's two branches in our program, one using the constant 0.4 and the other one using the constant 0.9. Now, whenever I'm showing these graphics, feel free to ignore any of the details like this V node here or the parallel copy instruction. We really just care for the general structure of the programs for the purpose of this talk, because that's what the tool mainly focuses about. And as you're seeing, the whole tool runs um, in the browser, actually. The presentation itself runs in the browser, and the tool is embedded in it. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'll be sharing a link, though, where you can try it out in your own browser. Um, and yeah, I've kind of just quickly hacked together this prototype in a few days, and then just went going from there. So. After a few days of having this graph render, I started just building on top of that and seeing where my journey leads us. And now, after a couple of months, it's gotten quite advanced, I'd say. So the first thing that you notice actually here is that this is already a simplified view. Instead of showing all the connectivity information that's contained on the left, it only really represents the programmer's view of the program. The programmer's view is just a simple branch, so it makes sense that there is an entry block, an exit block, and then the two branch bodies. But actually, Shader DNA can show you a different view of the same program, which is the hardware view. The hardware view looks a little bit different, because now instead of having this, um, uh, this split in the control flow, the edge, and edge connectivity is just from one block to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. So our blocks now are being executed in strict sequence. And if you're anything familiar at all with how GPUs work internally, that will immediately make sense to you. It's because GPUs are mass so massively parallelized that they always run programs in units of 32 or 64 threads. So branching doesn't really combine well with that paradigm. So GPUs kind of emulate branching with this concept called execution mask. Uh, which is one we see here. So whenever we execute this body that assigns 0.4 to the pixel value, um, instead of doing branching, the GPU will just disable all of the threads for which uh, that assignment should not take place. And then in this block, it inverts the execution mask, enabling all of the other um, threads of the current unit, and then it assigns 0.9 for those threads. Now, all of that sounds very technical, but ultimately, um, the structure, again, is just what matters here. So don't worry about it too much. The cool part is, though, that shader DNA allows you to switch between those two representations on the fly. Now, if you look at the full interface at the top, you see this linear setting and the logical one. This allows you to just freely swap between the two. And you see, if you care about the low-level details, particularly useful for optimizations, um, you can take a look, but if you only care about what is the shader doing, the logical view is ideal for that. And if you fancy, you can enable both at the same time even. But let's stick to the linear view for a moment, because I was actually kind of cheating before. The actual program does actually look like this. I was abbreviating it a little bit before. Now, what's going on here? Well, it turns out if the current group of 32 pixels that is being processed in a single unit is all above a certain line, let's say all in this whitish area, then what's even the point of executing these instructions? So ACO, the shader compiler used by RADV, actually emits a kind of shortcut branching where all of the threads just skip this, this block entirely and jump straight to the assignment of the 0.9 value. 
This is particularly important for bigger blocks, but we still emit it for Sybil uh, programs, because why not? But you can see, with all of that optimization and fanciness, the linear CFG is just blowing up quite a bit. So again, even for the complicated program, the logical view gives you a simplified idea of what's happening in the program. There's also a disassembly view. So if you paste in disassembly code, it can also render the control flow graph for that. So um, here the graph looks a little bit different, but if we post both of them in the same text area, you actually get a somewhat similar structure. So it can use the information from the AQIR to order the blocks accordingly, but it will still render the disassembly. But you can sort of just switch freely between the two if you want to. Now let's take a look at a somewhat more, more complicated example. And you can see this doesn't even fit on a single slide anymore. Um, we can't fit it on the screen. That doesn't really help. Hmm. Let's uh, take a look at the logical control flow graph, though. Huh. Well, that makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? We can now see that there's a block with a circular path leading back to itself. And what does that mean? Well, it's a loop. And if we look at the loop body, there's a very suspicious looking add with a zero with a 1.0 to a fixed variable that is used at the top here for a comparison. So that suggests it's this variable is a sort of loop counter, and the whole thing probably is a for loop, meaning that this is the path once the ter condition of the for loop terminates, leading to the program end. And indeed, if you look at the uh, source code of the shader that was used to generate this one, it's indeed just this for loop comparing against the fragment coordinate um, and adding 0.005 to the output color in each iteration. So what this generates is just a gradient on the triangle, making much more sense. Now, you might ask yourself, okay, why was the linear view so complicated there? Well, again, this is because of the hardware model and how AMD GPUs process threads. You always have to process groups of 32 or 64 threads at once, meaning if half of your threads are already done with the for loop, they still can't exit it because the other 32 threads are still carried around. So you only need to um, disable those first 32 threads while still running through the thread, through the, through the for loop for the other ones. And I find that particularly funny actually, because if you look at the logical CFG, once we reach this block, we're done. But in the linear view, there's actually a path pulling us back into the loop precisely because of this issue. So I think this model is quite useful to, like for beginners as well, just to learn about what the difference between these two intuitive model and the uh, hardware model of execution are. But again, just for developers as well, it's really useful to bring quick, quick understanding into how our game shaders work. Speaking of though, how about real shaders? Because we've only looked at these toy examples and it would be really annoying if for every single game you're debugging, you would have to copy paste thousands of shader lines of code uh, from the terminal into a web browser. So one tool that makes this actually quite easy to work with is Fossilize. Fossilize is kind of the Steam shader cache uh, for those not, uh, not familiar. Uh, <clears throat> Fossilize is a tool that allows you to capture the shaders used by an application and then play them back at a later point, similar to RenderDoc, just that it only really captures the shaders and compiles them. So it doesn't capture any assets, no, no textures, no 3D meshes, and it doesn't render anything. Why is that useful? Well, precisely if you want to optimize your shader compiler, you have a database of the shaders used by a game and you can just quickly access them and recompile them without having to launch the game over and over again. There's a tool called Fossilize Replay, which you can call on such shader caches, uh, which we also call Fossilize Databases, by the way. Um, once you could call Fossilize Replay on such a database, 
It will output some debug information about the application, and then it will start processing shaders. So once you enable RADV debug again, you will see in a standard output the disassembly of all the shaders compiled during fossilized replay execution. If you want to play around with this, you can try this at home, actually, if you have Steam installed, because all the Steam games just create fossilized databases by default in this path down here. Right. So the idea that I had was with the shader control flow visualization of shader DNA um, combined with fossilized would make for a great combination because um, instead of having to enter all of your shaders manually, you could now just drag and drop a file into the browser and it would just pass all the shaders for you. So that's what I did. At the bottom here is a link to a one of the Sasha Willems examples from uh, from the Vulkan examples repository. Um, if I just download this, I can drag and drop this into the browser. You can do this with any file in your in your local hard disk. Just go to your file explorer and drag and drop it into the browser, and a lot of things happen. But the first thing you probably noticed is it immediately loaded the first shader of the shader database. And again, it's a fairly complicated shader. You can try to fit it on the screen. It's it's really somewhat uh, somewhat big. But again, we have the logical control flow graph view, which cleans it up a little. And with that, we can see quite easily, despite not being able to read any of the instructions, we can immediately see it has this cascade of nested if else if statements. Uh, just going into else, 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 whenever an if hits, it just skips right past it. But the more interesting bit about this is actually the bot top line here. Um, because this is not just a single shader, but all of the shaders used by that um, by that Vulkan example. So you can swap between the graphics pipelines, so the shaders basically, freely. In this case, there's only four of them. You can change between vertex and fragment shader and the other ones. And you can even change between the AQIR and the disassembly of the uh, shader, which, yeah, again, it's it's quite something. But as you might imagine, it's quite handy to just have this central tool where you can easily compare the AQIR, the higher level of representation, um, and the final assembly code of the shader. Now, if you've seen this, um, I should have probably stressed that these fossilized databases, they only contain, contain uncompiled shaders. So they contain this BRV code. How do you, does it get from this BRV code to the AQIR though? It's not contained in the fossilized database, so. Apparently, shader DNA must be bundling a shader compiler. And the browser? How does that work? Huh. Well, if only there were an open source shader compiler we could easily integrate into the browser, but there is no such thing. But we've got Mesa. So let's port Mesa to WebAssembly. Now, there is actually a tool chain that allows us to compile native libraries written in C and C++ to JavaScript or WebAssembly. It's called mscripten, and it works just like any other cross-compiler. So we can actually integrate this quite cleanly into Mesa's build system, which is Mason-based. And we just need to write a cross file to tell Mason about how the compiler tool chain is, uh, is structured. So we, we tell a little bit about the binaries, EMCC and EM++ are just the equivalents to GCC and G++, as you might expect. We tell a little bit about the compilation target. And finally, we specify some build -ins, like some compiler options specific to mscript, and such as generate WebAssembly rather than web JavaScript, build as web worker so we can run things in the background, and some more things that are not really all that relevant for this one. If you want to try that out, you can do so using Mason build. Uh, just pass it in as a cross file and it will pick up all the right binaries and then build it using Ninja. Now, it wasn't quite that easy to get it working. It didn't 
just magically compile like that. One major obstacle was actually that RADV itself does not currently build without LLVM, despite having its own shader compiler these days. So I had to uh, refer back to Emmanuel's work about allowing RADV to build without LLVM. And I tidied it up a little and added some polish so that nowadays we can actually build RADV without LLVM. An alternative would have been to build LLVM, the compiler framework itself with mscript and then create an LLVM build that's executable in the browser. I actually did that and got it working, but the annoying bit is that it blows up the runtime size dramatically and you do not want to download a 25 megabyte JavaScript uh, file just for launching the tool. Um, and also it made compiling the shader significantly slower. So I really wanted to avoid that if possible. There's also a stash of a couple of minor patches, really not all that bad. I was surprised how pleasant the porting process actually was. Um, indeed, uh, most of the things I did was just removing things like runtime configuration with XML config or adding dummy uh, implementations of some module that are, is not really used, disabling debug functionality that we're not really using on the browser. None of that really was specific to, like there wasn't any specific if mscript and else hacks, it was more about disabling functionality uh, than anything else. If you want to take a look at these, um, this code, it's all public and uh, my GitLab branch right here. So feel free to take a look and give feedback if you have any anything to add. But yeah, it's all there. Now about rendering those fancy graphs, how does that work? Well, I'm actually using a tool called Graphis and it's amazing. It's genuinely fantastic. If you ever need to create reasonably polished gra graphs um, with very, very simple code, very little code even, um, Graphis is the tool of choice. So how does that work? You basically write your graph definitions in a DSL um, just by specifying a list of nodes. And the nodes are, in our case, the basic blocks uh, defined here. A list of edges, just with this magic arrow. And then you define some ordering relations just to tidy things up a little. So here, the first two nodes are put on the same vertical position, for instance, and the program exit block is put at the very bottom. And there are some extra attributes to add styling and whatnot, but yeah. If you want to generate a graph from this, you just take this, save it in a source dot dot file, and then run it through graphvis's dot renderer tool with the red parameters. And if you do that, you get something like this. So it's, it's not the most pretty graph, but I think it's a reasonably nice looking out of the box look really. And you can might imagine with custom fonts and some extra formatting, you get a really polished look out of this already. Again, Graphis is a native tool though. So we need a JavaScript build of that. Luckily, this has been done before. Um, this repository provides an mscriptum build for Graphis and it's super easy to use. You just define your dot source code in a JavaScript variable and then call this layout function. What this will do is it will return a string of the SVG, SVG source code of the rendered image. You could also render a PNG file, but SVG has one major benefit. It looks the same, but you can embed it in a web page. And by embedding it in a web page, you can actually interact with it. And that's not only useful to select, to allow the user to select and copy paste text out of it, but it also enables you to add interactivity to your program. If you uh, noticed before, when you hover over the variables in shader DNA, then you actually highlight all of the uses of that variable. Um, which is only possible because the graph is rendered as an SVG. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be easy to add that kind of feature. Right. So that's basically the two major building blocks that I wanted to show. Uh, just a quick overview of how it all ties together. And 
Yeah, at the beginning, of course, we have the shader database as a fossilized database, um, which might come from a Steam cache or just from a manual capture. We run that through libfossilize, which is basically fossilized replay, but uh, ported to JavaScript again using mscripten with some custom additions. And this is just a regular Vulkan application. So it goes through all of the lib Vulkan loader, then uh, into the RADV entry points, then into the echo shader compiler. And finally, the front end extracts the compiled shaders using the VK get shader info AMD extension. Now, all of those four steps are part of the mscript empowered WebAssembly build of Mesa, which is kind of amazing, right? We, uh, we're not taking any kind of shortcuts here. We're actually compiling the full stack of Mesa um, with this cross compiler and it just magically works, which definitely is a testament to how stable and robust mscript has become nowadays because you just take this super complicated piece of software and it just works in, um, just works in the browser. Now with the compiled shader, we uh, hand that over to um, shader DNA's shader block parser, which takes a look at the disassembly of the shader and clusters the instructions into the basic blocks and tries to find the connectivity information between them so that it finally can construct the control flow graph and emit that as a dot file, which we then run through the graph base renderer where it will produce an SVG file which is then integrated and displayed on the front end. Right. Now that's just one, one way of inputting. The other thing we've seen at the very beginning is there is a text input field as well, where you can just paste your shaders directly. In this case, you just bypass all of Mesa and you jump straight to the shader block parser itself, uh, where it will just analyze the shader directly. But Funnily enough, I actually added a separate code path, a separate path here where you do feed the text input if it's AQIR right back into Mesa. And for that, I actually wrote a, an AQIR parser that will reconstruct the data structures used by AQIR uh, for that particular shader to allow it to bypass Radvi and Libvulkan themselves and turn the shader from AQIR into disassembly directly. Funnily enough, this is actually um, kind of the first offline compiler build of ACO that we have. Currently, it's tightly coupled to RADV itself and cannot be used without. But with Shader DNA, you can indeed paste an ACOIR shader into the browser and use ACO independently like that. Now, if we come back to the previous example of the fossilized database, this might make a little bit more sense now. So. If I'm taking the fossilized database and dragging it in the browser again, you can see it has now used libfossilize um, to parse all of the shaders in that database. And it's now accessible through this combo box. You can easily browse between them. And whenever you select a new pipe, new shader in here, that is where the Vulkan loader is uh, invoked and Radvi and Echo are compiling the selected shader. And this is also why you can freely switch between AQI and the disassembly, because again, it's just running the shader compiler in the browser. Now, if you've been listening so far, you're probably in either of two camps. The first camp is probably, oh my god, how cool is that? And when can I use this already? The other camp is more like, okay, it looks kind of cool, but why would you go through all of that trouble? Why would you do that? Instead of just maybe, maybe you could have written an imgui tool that does the same thing, but without having to port Mesa uh, to mscripten. And there's actually a couple of reasons why I prefer to have this tool run in the browser itself. And the first one is probably most striking even, it's that we get all of the things that are available in the browser uh, as a platform for free. So we get all of the default widgets, we get easy styling using CSS. Um, you get accessibility features because um, other tools such as Imgui, I think don't really provide that all that easily. Whereas in the browser, it's reasonably standard and quite easy to, um, to figure out how to do that. And also you get access to all of the tooling that's available in the browser. 
from the performance monitor over to the DOM inspector. Everything is just there and you can use that to sort of debug the debugger. The other thing that I haven't really talked about um, at all so yet is TypeScript. The front end of Shader DNA is written in TypeScript and it's compared to C and C++ really convenient for this kind of interactive user program to have a garbage collector, to have concurrency primitives, and to have a reg regex engine that actually works. This is just things that the language gives us for free and it makes development of these uh, user, interactive, user interactive features so much more convenient. One other thing is there's a rich package ecosystem, which Shader DNA doesn't actually use that actively. I think it only has one dependency so far, two if you count graphers, three if you count Mesa in. So I could go, go nuts and use all sorts of different packages, but really all I'm using right now is uh, a base64 encoder for one particular collaboration feature. But it's still good to have that base64 encoder just ready to use rather than having to write my own. Finally, WebAssembly is kind of a key technology in, in all of this, because as you've seen, all of this runs in the browser, so you get virtually no compilation delays when switching between shaders. You just uh, select them, and within a couple of micro milliseconds, the compiled shader is there. Um, if you we hadn't had WebAssembly or, well, MScript in general available, then we would have probably needed to come up with some sort of server with them some sort of back and front end architecture here, which means we would have needed to set up a server back end um, involving a server infrastructure in particular. And all of that gets really nasty. And in particular, you also need to worry about the communication between the back end and the front end. And overall, you would never get the same user experience because just talking to a server takes time. And that's what we would, this kind of delay is what I wanted to avoid in this tool. Now, with all that being said, you might be asking yourself, what's in store for the future? And I have a couple of plans, actually. The first one being, um, I want to have broader GPU support here. You might have gotten the impression that Shader DNA is completely specific to AMD. Um, and indeed, that's true for now, but there is no inher inher inherent reason for that. It's just the one driver that I happen to be using at home. So that, that's been the main development focus for now. But you could just as easily port any of the other Mesa drivers to the tool. And it should be doable with reasonable effort. I'm not sure I want to do the work myself, but if you're interested in picking that up, I'd be more than happy to support any kind of efforts in that direction. Similarly, I don't just want to expose uh, AMD and MD disassembly and AQIR, but I want to enable shader DNA to display all of the different representations throughout the lifetime of a shader. So starting from Spear V, possibly even GLSL, it should be possible to show display the near code, the AQIR, and the disassembly, all of them at once. I actually even have a prototype for that available, at least for, for near and Spear V. GLSL is a different beast but we'll get there. And finally, I want to have more introspection, introspection features, which I think could be particularly useful for game developers who need to have an understanding of how well their shader will actually perform on native hardware without having to uh, get that hardware necessarily themselves. So ideally, you could just enter any kind of shader and browse through different sets of GPUs and show, okay, how does this shader perform on NVIDIA hardware? How does it perform on AMD hardware? How does it perform on Intel hardware? That's, that's kind of the long-term goal here. And with that, we are coming to the end. So here's a couple of resources. First of all, of course, the link to the shader DNA instance itself. You can just open that in your browser and drag and drop any of your Steam shader caches into that and play around with it. If you don't have Steam, you can also use the public repository ShaderDB here, which uh, bundles some of the Sasha Willems Vulkan examples, uh, which can also just be used easily. Um, other than that, I have another special gem for you, actually. Um, if you happen to be familiar with the Dolphin GameCube and Wii emulator, you might know 
they have this special code path called Uber shaders, where they emulate basically uh, large parts of the full GPU in a single vertex and fragment shader. So I couldn't help myself and I just created a fossilized capture of that Uber shader and tried loading it in shader DNA. And the link that I'll be posting will show you how that looks like. And with that, thanks for tuning in, and I'll be handing it over to future me and their host for the QA. Okay, and that was a talk by Tony Vasorka, who is with us for the QA talk. So, uh, Jason Ekstrand asks, can you use this tool to visualize near or other backend IRs? If not, do you have any plans to add support? So currently it cannot do that, but I have a local uh, patch for that, which is work in progress. So in the future, the idea is to have uh, not only disassembly and AQRL support, but also the higher level representations like NIR, like SPIRV, and perhaps in the future, even GLSL. As far as other backends goes, um, that's something that's not currently supported, which I would need support from uh, the respective driver developers if they're interested. So if, say, you wanted to have Intel support, um, some things would need to be done, such as making sure that the Intel driver compiles with mscripton, which might require if defing out some DRM bits, for instance, um, and the shader block parser itself uh, would probably need some adjustments for the um, disassembly format used by Intel. But yeah, other than that, um, it's I'm certainly interested in support for other backend uh, backend syntaxes as well. Yeah. Okay, and Vinimo asks, would it be possible to add a graph visualization of the instructions in a block too? It would be possible. I'm not sure how that would look like. If you can uh, create any kind of mockups for that, I uh, could consider it, yeah. And Jason Extract asks one more thing. Uh, render doc integration? What's that render doc integration? Do you know? Okay. Uh, uh, but, no, but render doc integration, it's, uh, yeah. I suppose you would have to bundle a web engine for that in, in render doc. So that's probably not something that's worth considering. Uh, but the general approach probably could be ported in some way. I'm not sure. I haven't considered it. Okay. And looks like that's all for questions today. Thank you very much for the great talk and uh, have a great there day. Was, there was one thing I wanted to add, actually. A small correction, um, or one thing I said in the very beginning is that I said that GPUs just all use execution masks for control flow. I did want to correct that. That's, of course, not true. It's specific to AMD GPUs. And uh, we've seen in Alyssa's talk yesterday that other GPUs tend to work quite differently. Uh, that's just something I wanted to add. Other than that, uh, thanks for having me. Thank you very much as well. Have a great conference.